am very pleased to be here today. You know that this is a part of the 10th year <coughs> celebration of the anniversary of the 10th year of the uh, uh, creation of the SSM and the Banking Union, the SSM being a part of the Banking Union, because I think that 10 years after what was clearly an historical event, <coughs> it's good that the SSM begins to reflect on its own history and integrate in, in this event about uh, uh, research, about supervision, also what can be the contributions of this, uh, I would say, decentered uh, look that an historian has on the, on the events, uh, which is more descriptive by definition. <laughs> Historians are normally much more descriptive than, I would say, theoretical economists, that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, but it also has this, um, uh, this different view of comparing with an embedding in the, in the cultural setting when it has been done in the history of uh, mentalities uh, and the general culture of uh, society that is, I think, very useful for everybody because we are not uh, in an ivory tower, we are working <laughs> in the middle of society. So to have this also this look upon us from the perspective of history, I think uh, can only bring things. And to do that, I, I'm really happy to have this panel <laughs> uh, that we succeeded in gathering uh, today because we, uh, we have uh, uh, with us, I will take him in the order that uh, they will uh, I say appear in the discussion. Uh, first, uh, we have Peter Conti Brown, who is a distinguished legal scholar, but also an economic historian, and is here because he has just finished writing a, a very, very exciting book on the history of uh, the supervision in the US, uh, uh, which uh, uh, it will be, you, you will hear from him whether, when we will be, uh, we will have access of that book because it's not yet <laughs> published, but it is essentially finished, uh, and I will, should say that I, I cannot but recommend to, to all people that are interested in, in uh, the history of supervision uh, to read that because it's uh, uh, not only very, I will say, instructive, but very funny also. <laughs> it is very easy to, uh, to read. Uh, I, I have, a, we have also uh, Rosa Maria Lastra from the Queen Mary University, which has written a lot of books about banking law, which, <laughs> where she teaches uh, banking law, uh, and so has an experience that is both rooted in the UK, where you've been for a, a long time, and we all know that UK is, is a very specific country for, uh, for banking uh, uh, supervision, but also you have very general reflections on the institutional setup of supervision and with uh, with the central banks and that so so uh, thank you uh, for being here uh, <coughs> we have also uh, pedro teixeira who is both he, he, he has both as it, it is a scholar that has made the most thorough book on the legal history of the uh, of the ssm that i know uh, in fact, and by the way, he was an actor on the first, uh, I would say, uh, maybe on the administrative put up, uh, but he, he was an actor of first rank order, I would say, in, in all the life of uh, these 10 years uh, uh, of the uh, SSM. So uh, uh, these three persons will talk us about the work that they have published, but um, I w wanted also, and this is quite an honor to have with us uh, Vitor, <laughs> to have it back, because of course this is his home, <laughs> where, where he was so so long time, and he is uh, a real witness, the best witness we can have of this <laughs> change that we had from a European landscape where Lots of people thought we should never put the supervision with the central bank, and then all of a sudden, if I may say, it was. So I think it's quite an interesting and an honor for us to have it. And to have this more conversational part of it, I, I, we have also Alexi Drag, who is, was not at all a part of it, but it is, it's really an historian, an academic historian, but that has. Uh, written what is unfortunately only in French. No, there are no English translation for the time being. But I think a very interesting history of uh, the Basel Committee, <laughs> where one of the things that comes up is that the international aspect of uh, uh, banking supervision, which is a very pregnant and very important issue, uh, we know about transposition of Basel III, um, <laughs> which is quite high in, uh, in our agenda. Supervisors was 
in, in the making, essentially pushed by the US, the UK, and the European Union. So that's, so it's not by chance that we have here people that have this, uh, can represent these three, because I think that behind, with all this, we have uh, really uh, a way to look at the DNA of banking federalism, what it is and what it was, why uh, this international aspect has been uh, very pregnant in, in banking supervision, and of course for us as ECB, it's extremely important. So the international dimension uh, of uh, banking supervision is, is paramount interest. So, uh, so with that, uh, I think we uh, uh, we shall begin to to have this. We will structure this in, in two uh, parts. We will have the three uh, um, interventions of uh, Peter, uh, Rosa, and Pedro uh, in a row, and open a first round of uh, uh, questions and answers. Normally, give us for an hour, and then we will have the, this more conversational part with uh, Vitor and Alexis, and we will have also uh, we will be asking ourselves questions here <laughs> in the panel. But uh, at the end, we will have another round of uh, question and answers for the panel. So, with that, uh, I just uh, give the floor to Peter. Very good. But I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know, as an American traveling in Europe. And, and as a historian, I'm more accustomed to uh, learning about the old ways in Europe uh, uh, to inform the new ways of the U.S. But this year, we are also celebrating an anniversary in bank supervision, and that's the 160th anniversary of federal bank supervision. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad to come to the new ways of, uh, of Frankfurt uh, and, and, and learn uh, these important lessons. For indeed, it is, it is important to recognize that the historian's key contribution to policy is not to remind us of a golden era that was always better, always simpler, always clearer, but in fact to remind us that some of the questions with which we are grappling can be translated conceptually uh, from the past as we project in the future, not because the, the past got it always right, but sometimes through the negative legacy of the ways that it got it wrong. And in my brief presentation, my remarks, I want to highlight a little bit uh, the, the thesis and trajectory of this book uh, that I've just finished with my co-author, Sean Benatta, a historian at the University of Glasgow. The book is called Private Finance, Public Power, A History of Bank Supervision in America. Uh, and in it, uh, we describe the way that the uh, institutional ecosystem of bank supervision evolved from a rather haphazard set of ideas, legal doctrines, personalities, wars, scandals, uh, uh, and depressions to become something that is uh, uh, unwieldy, uh, that can have errors, that can misfire, but that mostly works pretty well, sometimes in spite of itself. And indeed, for a long time, uh, the, the book was called The Banker's Thumb. Uh, an allusion to the essay by um, uh, biologist, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould's Panda's Thumb, wherein he theorized that the sixth digit on the panda's paw, which seemed peculiarly well designed to strip bamboo uh, uh, proteins for, that constituted the panda's diet, and giving rise to the idea that that is clearly a manifestation of a loving deity. Gould thought not at all. Uh, it's actually quite inefficient. No loving deity would, uh, would uh, punish a panda with that uh, extra digit. What it spoke to instead were evolutionary processes, and we think that bank supervision follows exactly that trajectory. Uh, our editor uh, agrees with the thesis, uh, hated the title. Nobody apparently reads Stephen Jay Gould anymore, so uh, hence, uh, hence the new title. I want to tell you then where, uh, from whence its origins. And the origins of bank supervision arise from the common law visitorial power, a power seldom exercised, but the idea is that the sovereign and common law, the king, uh, had the ability for any chartered entity within uh, his realm to inspect anything that he saw worthy of inspection, he or his delegates. That visitorial power applied again to any chartered institution, which included just about everything uh, in, uh, in common law, uh, prior to the glorious revolution, uh, uh, given the absolute supremacy uh, of the king uh, in his realm. 
But the visitorial authority was seen as a kind of uh, extreme occasion. But from here, bank supervision originally uh, emerges in the late 18th century. First Bank of the United States, Alexander Hamilton's project, uh, modeled after the Bank of England, preserved that visitorial authority for the US Congress, uh, even though Congress was itself not only the chartering institution for the Bank of the United States, but indeed uh, its largest investor. The visitorial power was never used for the First Bank of the United States, but it was used for the Second Bank of the United States. And that idea of public control of chartered institutions starts the seed of bank supervision. Uh, it emerged far beyond, uh, it evolved far beyond that, that authority. First in those banks of the United States, first and second, as a kind of counterparty verification. Now this idea, uh, while the visitorial power has largely become uh, 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 extinct in, in the supervisory framework, the counterparty authority still survives in the form of the discount window at the, the central bank, exercising a very important kind of supervisory authority, uh, and, and also uh, deposit insurance. The idea is that the provision of priced services requires certain kinds of commitments. And we have seen in various forms the exercise of supervision through that vector, sometimes leading to good outcomes, sometimes leading uh, uh, to quite bad outcomes, sometimes creating a lot of redundancies, uh, sometimes creating uh, uh, much difficulty. The banking crisis in 2023 in the United States, we saw instances of priced supervision from the Federal Reserve, from the FDIC, and from the curious institutions, the federal home loan banks, uh, creating something of a traffic jam with more conventional supervisory authorities. Uh, I said that federal bank supervision in the United States celebrates its 160th anniversary today, and then I've just told you that it actually goes back to King Henry VIII. Uh, the fact is that federal uh, bank supervision in the form of structured examinations celebrates this anniversary. And that arose during the Civil War. Uh, Congress created a mechanism through which we would not have a bank of the United States, but many banks, hopefully thousands of banks of, uh, uh, of the United States called national banks, given a charter uh, that would preempt state banks. The framers of, that, of those acts, the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 64, had the hope that they would cause the extinction of state banks. They were very wrong about this. And this evolutionary uh, uh, node, this punctuated equilibrium, created in the United States something that we see in Europe too, a kind of dual banking system, banking federalism. And this idea of having two different levels of chartering authority and through chartering authority, examination authority, uh, created one of the most uh, interesting, dynamic, painful, uh, and important elements of, of US examination. Bank examination after the Civil War uh, uh, suffered terribly. Examination here needed a theory and it didn't have one. The first theory was examiners will certify banker honesty. There shall be no fraud where there is federal examination. Problem was this lasted about 18 months and then the first fraudsters in banks and then the first fraudsters in the examiner's offices emerged. And it turned out that the overworked, underpaid bank examiners found lots of opportunities of turning a blind eye to poor performance in exchange for private loans. Uh, the Colander Affair uh, is one that we unearthed, dominated the newspapers in the, uh, in the early 1870s, largely forgotten uh, uh, until we have now retold it in this book. Um, for that reason, the control of the currency in the 1880s, 90s, and early 2000s through a series of uh, ever more crippling banking crises uh, realized that couldn't verify banker honesty. It had no balance sheet to provide bankers with liquidity. And the informational and other disadvantages that examiners experienced during that time uh, meant that it was very limited in what it could do. It could learn some things, but not many things, and it, could not, it couldn't stave off these crippling panics. The Federal Reserve System was the answer to that question. And with it came not only the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve banks, modeled once again on central banking institutions from Europe, but also provided an examination authority explicitly meant to be originally to displace the comptroller of the currency. There was no need uh, after the advent of central banking in the United States for that uh, office's original function. But as so often occurs in what political scientists call institutional layering, we never have the privilege of starting over. We don't get to wipe the slate clean. We build instead institutions upon other institutions. And here the Federal Reserve was built on top of and next to the comptroller of the currency 
uh, and indeed the comptroller of the currency sat on the original Federal Reserve Board until 1935. Uh, and they hated each other almost from the jump. The OCC and the Fed warred about control of examination reports, about theories of examination. The OCC wanted to exercise informational control, including forbearance, forbearance on determining when banks were ready for uh, the chopping block of liquidation when they were not. Uh, and the Federal Reserve wanted to preserve and protect its own balance sheet. Now, I'm at nine minutes, and I'm only at about 1930. Uh, so let me just go sprint through the last 50 years of this history. I'll say this, that in January 1933, uh, Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor uh, of Germany. Uh, Mussolini had already had a decade plus uh, of experience governing Italy. And in March 1933, Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated president. Roosevelt's supporters and Roosevelt's detractors both hoped that he would usurp the role of dictator uh, in uh, facing what was the most catastrophic of banking crises. What he did instead was lean on the legitimacy, authority, information, and balance sheet of the bank examiners. In the pivotal chapter of our book, uh, uh, we describe the bank holiday through the eyes of bank examiners to see that Franklin Roosevelt's strategy was not simply to hold lots of charismatic fireside chats. Herbert Hoover had mastered that art before him. What he did instead was use the incredible core of bank examiners. The FDIC followed almost immediately. And through those three uh, bank supervisory institutions, the Fed, OCC, and FDIC, we came to a kind of measured peace. That measured peace proved so successful in the post-war years, in part because of the ascendancy of the American economy and the devastation uh, that uh, 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 American enterprise faced throughout the globe, meant that banking was boring and bank examiners, uh, boring if profitable, and bank examiners received that credit. The shift had then come back to the public uh, side in risk management. Eventually, Congress then started adding more and more functionality to bank supervision not only to verify, certify the safety and soundness of individual institutions or of the entire system, but to verify their compliance with ever uh, more complex laws, including protecting of consumers, prohibitions against discrimination, mandates to reinvest in underinvested communities, mandates to be arms of the state in policing, money laundering, and much else besides. Uh, the, we stop our account in 1980 because on or about October 1979, uh, the world changed, and it changed in ways that make for another volume. Uh, but this, this ecosystem of supervision leaves unresolved some key questions, including uh, in the tug of war between public and private over the residual risk in the financial system, where do we draw the line? This, an this question uh, is essentially unanswerable in any kind of durable way. Uh, people in this room and people in other rooms throughout the world will be answering it for themselves uh, in ways that will be different from the ways that their predecessors and successors will answer the same question. Second is, what tools should be used? And here, the ever-expanding toolbox of uh, supervisory tools continues to accelerate apace. We've heard papers today and yesterday that describe some of these to tools which were unimaginable even a generation ago to examiners, and so we will see a generation hence. And then finally, what are the risks that are relevant? Uh, those two are constantly changing. Uh, and with that, uh, let me conclude. Anyone who would like to see the manuscript, uh, Edward was not exaggerating, it really is done. Uh, it won't be the 20th anniversary of the SSM before you have it in your hands. Uh, although book publication processes are a little slower than I would prefer. If you'd like to see the manuscript or any part of it, just to contact me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for this offer. And uh, you could, this book can be made available to those uh, who want it. And, uh, and again, it, it deserves. Um, one of the points I, as a reader, I took from your book was, uh, for example, uh, history of the uh, control of the currency, that for a long time, his only tool was forbearance because the only decision he could take was to withdraw the authorization. <laughs> and of course, it, it was always very difficult to step in and first act, withdraw the authorization. So what you're saying is in, the, in this uh, um, management of residual risk, it is absolutely essential to give uh, to the public part this discretion on the use of effective tools <laughs> that really can move the banks uh, to change. 
uh, and I think this resonates with what a lot of things that we've heard this <coughs> these two days, the, the importance of uh, discretion in uh, the efficiency of supervision um, uh, there. But of course, uh, I cover that I also have a legal background, but uh, I would turn to Rosa Maria with I mean, this idea in, in question. If supervision is all about the exercise of effective powers with discretion, what do we need to counterbalance that? <laughs> because we don't want to be Hitler or Mussolini. Yeah, that's absolutely clear. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Eduard, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be in this table with dear friends and colleagues. He asked me to talk about, obviously, what you do about discretion. And what you do about discretion is to have mechanisms of accountability. But before doing that, I just wanted to start with some definitions. And I'm glad that my other good friend, Rafael, this morning in his excellent keynote, and presenting his model talk about the difference between regulation and supervision. So let me start with that in order to understand what is supervisory discretion. So regulation and supervision are two complementary, albeit different concepts. So regulation refers to the establishment of rules, to the process of rulemaking, and includes legislative acts and instruments issued by the competent authorities at the national and European level. And it continues to grow and grow. We also have soft law in addition to hard law. That's regulation. Then what's supervision? Supervision in a broad sense is a process with four stages. The first stage is the licensing, chartering, authorization. Second stage is what I call supervision in stricto sense, what we typically refer as discretionary management of what um, Peter calls financial residual risk. The third stage is sanctioning, the imposition of penalties in the case of non-compliance with the law, also the withdrawal of a license. And then the fourth stage is crisis management, which comprises lender of large resort, deposit insurance, resolution, and bank liquidation. Supervision and crisis management are a bit of a seamless process, because when you're supervising health institutions, if they turn into trouble institutions, then you get into crisis management. And actually also, Rafael, this morning, when talking about the pulling the trigger of the penal or likely to fail criterion, which is a, a, a power which the ECB exercises in the context of banking union, actually refer to that. But supervision is strict sensu, strict supervision. What is supervision? So it's the monitoring of the safety and soundness of the bank during its healthy life, which has been measured in different ways, capital assets, management, earnings, liquidity. That's the common system in the US. We have other systems. It's also the oversight of the banks and bankers' behavior and the gathering of information about the condition of the bank, which entails risk monitoring and risk control. So supervision is much more than compliance, and there I agree entirely with my friend Peter, though compliance is part of supervision. Further, the concept of supervision is not static but dynamic. The difference between micro and macro prudential supervision, though the latter could be also regarded as a policy rather than supervision, and between prudential and conduct of business, as in the UK, evidence the dynamism of the concept. So let me now go briefly into rules versus discretion. The supervisory activity, by definition, entails a judgment, a degree of discretion. This risk monitoring, this risk control is the discretionary activity. Back in 1942, in the context of the proposals that led to the establishment of the IMF, Keynes famously stated, perhaps the most difficult question is how much to decide by rule and how much to leave to discretion. This is the eternal challenge in administrative law as it is in monetary policy, and I put it to you as it is in supervision. This challenge, of course, and Peter was referring, and we heard presentations over the last two days, supervisors going forward will have to come up with even more instruments and tools to deal with the digital and AI developments. But notwithstanding this, discretion is fundamental to understand supervision. In the UK, and also in Eduard asked me to briefly reflect upon this supervision in and out of the central bank, of which the UK is a very clear example. The advent of a normative formal framework for supervision was triggered by the first banking directive in 1977, as well as the banking crisis in the US, the so-called secondary banking crisis of 1973 to 1975. This led to the adoption of a very minimalistic framework for formal supervision in the UK which was the 1977 Banking Act. And you can say, well, up until then, what had the Bank of England been doing? Well, the bank had acted as banker's bank 
in the relative role as central bank and had had not formal supervisory responsibilities, but informal prudential policies, for instance, with the need to maintain high liquidity. And reflecting on the need for judgment and discretion, Alan Sproul, president of the New York Fed in 1955, he said, we can be certain that reliance on any simple rule or set of rules would be dangerous. Judgment and wisdom were quite as needed as facts and theories. The federal research system also needs the guidance of practical wisdom, which is born only out of experience. The balance between rules and discretion actually is different in each of the stages of the supervisory process. So with regard to the first stage, there is a mix of rules versus discretion when the authorities grant a license. And this function is also related to the shape of the financial system, to the balance between competition and regulation, and to the design of sound banking. In the second stage, the key stage supervisory supervision is strict to censor, the ongoing monitoring and oversight of the health of the bank, the risk monitoring and risk control, these are by definition judgmental functions. They are discretionary activities and therefore the balance deals toward discretion. When it comes to the third stage, sanctioning clearly it has to be rule-based. Neither institutional sanctions nor personal sanctions can be subject to judgment calls. The ladder of sanctions need to be known clearly ex ante. When it comes to crisis management, and there are many people in this room and in this table that know a lot about crisis management, is a mix of rules and discretion. While a lender of large resort is discretionary, deposit insurance, solution, and liquidation or insolvency, or cannot be subject to some sort of judgment call. Debtors and creditors demand credibility, and therefore we need to have the balance tilting towards rules. So let me just reflect supervision and central banking in the context of the UK. So the, the, it is actually the US federal research system that uh, Peter has examined in his excellent book that provides the most clear example of the link between supervision and central banking. In the context of proposed reforms to the US regulatory structure in 1983, Paul Volcker, then chairman of the Fed, stated that a basic continuing responsibility for any central bank and the principal reason for the establishment of the Fed is to assure a stable and smoothly functioning financial and payment systems. These supervisory functions, he argued, or in addition to and largely predate the more purely monetary functions. Historically, in fact, the monetary functions were largely grafted onto the supervisory functions and not the reverse. Building on the intimate relationship, Charles Good had in his book, The Evolution of Central Banks, argued that the central core and rationale for the systems and function of the central bank is not necessarily to be found in monetary policy, but in its micro functions. But the pendulum for keeping supervision in central banking has changed over time and across country. And in the UK is an example of the in and the out. And I will not go with the arguments for and against which have been examined, but rather talking factually what happened. So the Bank of England Act 1998, following the coming into power of Tony Blair, we may have soon a Labour government in the UK again, granted operational independence. It was actually a Labour government and not a Conservative government that granted independence to the Bank of England and established the Monetary Policy Committee a bit with the same commitment as the Bundesbank, Bundesbank with the primary objective of achieving price stability and to preserve the single-mindedness of the bank's role as a monetary authority and the credibility of its focus on controlling inflation, banking supervision was transferred from the Bank of England to a newly created financial services authority, which became the single regulator for the entire financial sector in the UK. Roll the clock forward. The global financial crisis led to a major reform of the supervisory and regulatory structure of the UK following the Northern Rock Bank run. There was a memorandum of understanding between the Financial Services Authority, h and and the Bank of England, which just did not work, and was heavily criticized in a parliamentary report, which was called the Run on the Rock, and a very a, a clear example of what happened. And the FSA was actually ultimately dismantled. Supervision then was transferred back to the Bank of England, and more powers were transferred to the Bank of England. The bank became the macro and the micro super, su, prudential supervisory authority, as well as the resolution authority in the UK. The Financial Services Act 
2012 established a Twin Peak regime to replace the FSA with the Financial Conduct Authority for Consumer Protection and Conduct of Business and a Prudential Regulation Authority for the prudential supervision of banks but also insurance companies. Also, it added financial stability as a statutory objective of the Bank of England and created new, new objectives for the PRA, which was the part of the Bank of England in charge of supervision, safety and soundness and competition. The growth in objectives is, a, is one of the issues that actually complicates the exercise of what I'm going to talk next, which is the exercise of accountability. Because following Brexit, a new piece of legislation was adopted in 2023, and this gave the Bank of England two new objectives. One is international competitiveness and growth. Yes, that's a goal for the Prudential Supervisory Authority, as it is a goal for the Financial Conduct Authority, and also innovation, because the UK wants to be, at, in the, in the post-Brexit world, one of the most innovative forces that can compete in the world economy by providing, among others, a framework for digital assets, as well as just digital innovation in general. So now we, we come to the last part, and I will just spend a few minutes talking about the balance between independence and accountability. So independence, whether it's in monetary policy or in supervision, and again, in Rafael this morning said that the framework for supervision can get a leave from the framework for independence. I have not seen his speech, but independence gives officials a, a degree of discretion, which is the freedom to act in the pursuit of the delegated mandate, subject to a framework of rules. But the meaning of independence in the exercise of supervision is not the same as the meaning of independence in the conduct of monetary policy. There are differences with regard to the goals, the instruments, the personnel, and the very nature of the supervisory work. And while independence from supervision is needed in, independence from political instruction is needed in supervision, and it's also recognized by the principle two of the core principles of the core principles for effective banking supervision of the Basel Committee, it is not the same. And we also need independence from regulatory capture, freedom from regulatory capture, as well as legal protection for supervisors. So it's a different balance. But then we come now to accountability. Supervisory accountability is also different from monetary accountability. For example, while transparency in monetary policy is clearly advantageous and desirable, the benefits are not always that clear when it comes to supervision due to the nature of bank runs. The recent inquiry into the Bank of England by the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee, where I had the great honor of serving as their specialist advisor, provides a clear example how the broadening of the remit of the central bank in the exercise of supervisory responsibility needs to be accompanied by adequate mechanisms of accountability. And in addition to the expanded statutory objectives, the remit letters, the regulatory principles, we need to consider what it is that the supervisors need to be accountable for. If we consider that supervision is institutionalized discretion in the management of residual financial risk, which is the, incidentally, the definition that Peter Conti Brown and Sean Banata do in this book, how can we actually exercise adequate supervision? So should we rely on the traditional mechanisms of accountability? And these are institutional accountability, which is based on the trias politica. You bring the unelected institution back to the mechanisms of a democracy, parliamentary democracy, audit control, judicial review in those countries where you have judi judicial review of the decisions, as well as the degree of coordination with the government. You also have, a dim a, as the institutional dimension, you also have the technical dimension of accountability, which goes beyond performance accountability, which is the traditional dimension that economists like to focus more. And, but we also need an objective assessment, if we can get that, of risk and uncertainty. In line with Frank Elderson's speech last night, he said that the exact mechanisms of mapping actual hazards to risks need to be analyzed further to fully capture climate and nature-related factors in quantifiable regulatory and supervisory requirements. So how do we devise these innovative forms of accountability? Do we do it via further consultations with the industry, with consumer groups, without being subject to regulatory capture? 
Do we do it through proportionality assessments? Do we do it through independent evaluation offices that look at the work from a different perspective? Do we do it by enhancing the capabilities of supervisors by establishing a dialogue, um, a fruitful dialogue with scientists or hiring climate experts in the case of climate change? How do we achieve an objective assessment of the discretion of supervisors? And this is part of the challenge going forward. And then we also need to remember that though transparency has a different dimension in monetary policy than in supervision, we also need more effective communication. So what are the functions of communication? Communication plays different functions. It's reflection. You were talking, Eduardo, about reflecting upon what has happened in the last 10 years, what has happened in the 160 years. Translation to translate to both financial market expectations as well as households, kind of a teaching, teaching function. Management of expectations link, of course, to this translation listening and legitimation, and how do we achieve these innovative forms of accountability? So let me finish with some words of my maestro, Charles Goodhart, who noted that supervision is a thankless task where successes are hidden and failures are trampled. And last night in the discussion that we were having ahead of the preparation for today's session, Eduard asked me, but isn't supervision impossible? Is good supervision impossible? And with that question, I will pass another word to Pedro. Thanks a lot, Rosan. We are going to hear uh, from Pedro how supervision in the central bank in the Eurozone became possible and what it how it transformed supervision in the uh, in the European Union in the 10 last years. So, well, thank you very much, Edouard, for the, for the invitation. I think, I mean, also this panel implicitly is very much a homage to you that uh, you are close to completing your, your mandate as member of the supervisory board. And as everybody knows, Edouard has been also one of the pioneers with uh, not only the drafting of the SSM regulation, the SSM framework regulation, of course, head of the ACPI in France, and uh, I mean, it was really has been an honor to, to work with you as a supervisory board member. So thank you very much already. You still have two months and a half, but as you know, it's a long farewell. Um, so indeed, I wanted to, uh, to 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 reflect a little bit about the origins of the European banking supervision. So um, sort of uh, thinking aloud. Um, more certainly from an academic perspective and not uh, necessarily CB views. Uh, but I see that there, are, there have been uh, two narratives, and I think it complements well what my colleagues were referring before. I think there are two narratives on why uh, we have uh, European banking supervision. So the first narrative is the first one is the internal market narrative. Uh, as uh, Rosa Maria was, was mentioning, uh, we started in the 70s with the first uh, banking directives with uh, having supervision and banking regulation as a tool for market integration. So the, the objective of uh, trying to develop uh, European banking regulation and European banking supervision was to integrate uh, the banking markets to have a single uh, European banking market. So it started in the 70s uh, with great progress uh, in the 80s with the single uh, European uh, passport in financial services. Uh, it then moved to the Financial Services Action Plan in 1999, uh, and it was a, a narrative that dominated the why we should have European banking supervision. And there were several features to it. This narrative was based on the decentralization, that uh, we would have mainly banking law via directives. We would have uh, national authorities in the lead, uh, and very loosely coordinated via committees. Um, this narrative uh, then clashed with the second narrative, which is a narrative of the monetary union. So uh, one of my first jobs here at ECB now 25 years ago was uh, to uh, work with Tommaso Pazchioppa and justifying in his speeches why we needed to have banking supervision uh, in the Eurozone. So the argument was a monetary union without uh, European banking supervision uh, would not work. Uh, so this was his argument starting in 1999, uh, and we had the, the first confirmation that uh, uh, Tomaso Pazkiopo was right in the first 
crisis, the 2008 great financial crisis, where the internal market narrative for banking supervision in a way collapsed, meaning that when we have the great financial crisis, the committees of supervisors were not able to manage the crisis. So there was no, even though there was a lot of push for integration, in reality, uh, there was no uh, safety net. And when there was a crisis, the single banking market disintegrated. And this was particularly seen when we had the European banking groups that then were split uh, along national lines. So there in 2008, the internal market narrative of, of why we needed financial uh, European banking supervision collapsed. And we had then the monetary union narrative starting to take hold, meaning that uh, it was clear and uh, this is uh, a fact that also the recovery, the economic recovery in Europe after 2008 was hindered by the fact that we did not have a European banking market. We did not have the ability to recapitalize the banking system uh, in, in a centralized way. And uh, this has started to, to, to be felt that indeed without uh, European banking supervision, the monetary union would be at risk. And so the main outcome uh, was to create the now European uh, supervisory agencies, so the EBA, the EOPA, and the ESMA, that were created after the 2008 financial crisis to still try to keep the, this internal market uh, narrative going. And then the next clash was, of course, in the European sovereign debt crisis, where uh, we had the doom loop, so it was, a, uh, in my view, a consequence of the internal market uh, approach to integration where we had the doom loop where the, each member state, particularly in the, banking union, in the monetary union, was uh, then having a deterioration of their public finances by the fact that they were assuming liabilities for the banking losses in their respective member state. So this uh, doom loop uh, started to accelerate uh, so much so that, uh, and it's now 12 years ago, uh, we had the summit uh, of the Euro Summit in, on the 29th of June 2012, where it was decided that to cut this doom loop, we would have to transfer banking supervision to the ECB. And so uh, in, this, uh, in this state, so 12 years ago, we had the monetary union narrative then dominating and replacing the internal market narrative on why we needed European banking supervision. And this is important in my view because it shows that the nature of banking supervision in Europe is different from, from what many assume. So by the fact that monetary union took uh, the, the, the lead in the narrative, it implied that integration is not uh, a name of banking supervision. So I mean, uh, actually one of the things that uh, we cannot celebrate is that in 10 years of the banking union, we had very little integration in the banking market, if any. So the, the, the fact that we have European banking supervision now is not for uh, having more integration. So that uh, you, you find it's, uh, some references, but that's not an objective. Um, the fact as well that it is for financial stability, uh, clearly this is an objective of banking supervision, but a bit provocative, provocatively, I also think that that is not also very much the dominant feature. I think the dominant feature is the fact that banking supervision in Europe was created to minimize the risk of fiscal liabilities. So what was decided on 29th of June 2012 was by the fact of moving supervision to the ECB, we would not be relying on national authorities that in the view uh, of many were not to be trusted to limit the risk of fiscal liabilities from the banking sector. So what we had was this transfer of supervision with the aim of minimizing the risk of public liabilities. And as you know, at the time, the, the idea was that ECB would take over supervision and in return, the European stability mechanism would recapitalize directly the banks. This never happened because we had then the European resolution regime coming into force with a single resolution mechanism. And so what we had was supervision, in my view, again, a bit provocatively, as a tool to uh, avoid the, the possibility of public bailouts, so replace the public liability for the banking sector for private liability in the, in the form of the resolution fund. But as we discussed actually on Monday in a very nice uh, workshop organized by DUI, even, there's even resistance to use private funds like those from the single resolution fund to use for banking crisis. So what, I, what I'm trying to argue here is that even though banking supervision in the beginning started with the idea that it was a tool for market integration in the internal market, 
it became very much a tool to avoid any liabilities stemming from the banking sector. So no public bailouts, and given also the rules of resolution, uh, even the use of single resolution fund is severely limited. And so my conclusion for uh, the, to provoke your, your thoughts is, I mean, what will be the test then of the banking union? I think the test will be clearly when we have a banking crisis and in probabilistic terms we'll have eventually one, hopefully I'll be retired by then, uh, where then there'll be costs. And so that will be the proof of the pudding, whether the banking union, how it will be resilient and sustainable when we have a banking crisis that will, will lead to costs. Because I think the, the, the question mark about who uh, takes over the costs of a banking crisis in the banking union is still to, to be solved. And I see Nicola seems to agree. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you indeed. Indeed, in, in Europe, we think that uh, public money is can be national money, European money, but also and industry money. You know that uh, from a competition point of view, uh, uh, in Europe you consider that a deposit insurance is public money. <laughs> so, so we have a large uh, a conception of public money, which makes not the, the discussions not uh, not so easy. Uh, but this is a really a provocative thought about <laughs> what are the real objectives, <laughs> what is the mandate of supervision uh, in Europe. So. Uh, uh, now, uh, from uh, this first uh, batch of intervention for, for that, I uh, would like to know if uh, there are some uh, questions uh, from the audience on, on here. I, uh, yep, please, Pantip. You're very well known, but identify yourself. Pente <laughs> Akarainen, and Chair uh, in the Administrative Code of Review, the ECB. And uh, first, many thanks. Very, very, very rewarding presentations and um, insights uh, uh, when it comes to different uh, jurisdictions and what uh, has happened. My question is to Peter. And um, having seen now the development, the evolution in the states, what is the next? Base. What is needed? Should it be because uh, when uh, looking it from uh, this side of the Atlantic, it uh, looks quite uh, well complicated uh, in terms of uh, institutional setting. Thank you. Do you know? I don't know if there's a time in American history where that sentence would not be true. You know, we could say that institutional complexity has been here. Always, and, and I won't defend it necessarily. I don't think any expert in financial regulation or bank supervision or central banking, if we sat together uh, either individually or as a group, would emerge from that meeting having designed the system as the American system is designed. So those complexities uh, uh, are, are not well designed, no doubt about it. Um, they're also not going anywhere. My co-author and I, counted 21 different serious legislative efforts by which we defined as legislative packages that passed one house uh, or the other to simplify or unify the um, supervisory system. 21 times uh, since uh, 1913. Every one of, of them failed. And they failed for specific political economy reasons. Uh, there's a lot to be gained by different constituencies for the present system as it exists. So that complexity is not going anywhere uh, in terms of becoming more simple. It is likely, or to, is likely to become more complex. Uh, and where will that be? I think that there is good. Uh, there's there there are at least even odds that we will see some sort of crypto supervision that will be specific. I don't know institutionally specific. I don't know that we'll have a uh, the crypto supervisor. I doubt that very much. The bill that's currently being debated under stablecoin does not do that. Um, but it does create specific supervisory mechanisms to assess crypto risk. So I think that's going to arise again on its own, uh, on its own uh, energy. The other that I would say is we are seeing uh, at a time that is not, not unique but is still quite pitched political controversy around what, sup what risks supervisors should face. So banks uh, that do business in Florida, including banks with a national charter that should be subject only to uniform national standards. Uh, the state of Florida has passed what's called the Fair Access 
uh, and fair lending rules, which mean that uh, uh, banks that do business in Florida cannot, in Florida, uh, depending on your interpretation of this law, um, uh, discriminate in any of their practices on anything that could be interpreted as a political basis. Now, I invite all of you in this room to define political basis. You will fail, right? There's no clear definition for it. Uh, and so as banks and bank supervisors and regulators start to assess what constitutes appropriate risks with political implications, be they climate risks, reputational risks, lending to gun manufacturers, for example, um, uh, and, and other uh, forms of this, I think that will that will continue to arise. Uh, and then finally, I would say, what will happen with the way that artificial intelligence is regulated and supervised in the uh, United States will have direct bearing on bank supervision? One that's already occurred is that bank supervisors are thinking about both how to use artificial intelligence to assist them in the work that they're doing. Second, to assess the bank's use of artificial intelligence. But I wouldn't even limit it there. I'm working on an article uh, that will be available for circulation in a couple of months with my colleague Kevin Werbach, who's an AI uh, expert, where we're looking at all the conceptions of risk management from bank supervision and thinking about the ways that AI scholars and practitioners are thinking about risk conceptions within AI. Uh, and the reality is that the, an awful lot of AI risk conceptualization reinvents an awful lot of wheels that we have seen in bank supervision for a long time. And so I think those uh, are the vectors that I would see uh, uh, continuing to evolve, um, but only making this uh, delightful field more interesting to study, not simpler. And this is, this is for you, Rosa. Um, in, in thinking about the differences between independence for monetary policy and for bank supervision, it strikes me as one of the key elements is that uh, the objective of monetary policy in terms of price stability can be measured. You have the inflation data, and therefore you can be accountable in relation to that measure. Whereas in the case of uh, bank supervision, I mean, the concept of financial stability cannot be sort of measured in any kind of equivalent way. And I'm, I mean, I, I don't think that you made this distinction in your discussion, so maybe you can comment on why not. Thank you, Rafael. You know, given the limited time, I didn't elaborate on the, on the differences between monetary and supervisory independence in terms of the goals, the instruments, the personnel, and the nature of the work. But uh, with, with regard to your specific point, it is true that the inflation target and the way that we measure price stability allows comparisons and allows a clear way of defining the objective. While financial stability remains up to this day a discretionary concept, there is not consensus in the economics profession on a standard definition and metrics of financial stability. So that complicates a lot the, the work for supervisors. Supervisors as opposed to monetary authorities, which really follow still, even if, for instance, in the UK, they need to take into account by law, by statute, financial stability, something which in the EU is still a contributory task, and in the US has a different framework. But um, when, um, if you just follow the Timberger rule, they have a very, very clear understanding of how they're going to measure inflation, even if now the law talks about changing perhaps the 2%. When it comes to financial stability, not only it is difficult to define it, it is difficult also to understand the cross-border dimension of financial stability and the fact that it is not only a goal for the supervisory authorities, it's also a goal for the government, so it's a goal for other authorities. All the supervisory agencies these days have to actually take into account financial stability. And then for supervisors, financial stability actually coexists with other goals because supervisors also need to take into account the safety and soundness on an individual level one sometimes can argue that the individual compliance with capital requirements or liquidity requirements or large exposures, as we heard this morning, is not necessarily the view of the forest that you will have when you look at financial stability in a broader dimension. And then they need to look at other objectives, consumer protection, anti-money laundering, competition rules. So supervisors not only don't have a clear definition of what constitutes financial stability 
if that is their primary goal, but they need to look at other objectives. So I think, you know, that complicates the nature of the supervisory work and complexity actually frustrates accountability. So that makes accountability even more difficult because not only there is not a clear definition of what is understood by financial stability, but also financial stability coexists with other goals. And then the very nature of financial stability means that it has a cross-border dimension. So that makes the exercise of the judgments of supervision very difficult. But that's a, you know, one a very good question. One can also go into the different instruments, for instance, personnel, if I may say, um, when you have monetary policy within the monetary policy committee, it's kind of like a Supreme Court on the decisions on interest rates. The nature of the supervisory work, by definition, relies on supervisory inspections, the use of a large number of supervisory personnel. So again, that's another difference. Another difference, which has to do in a way, financial stability also has a dimension of economic stability. And that is why it's such a discretionary concept in itself, is that the, the separation, the clear separation between the government and the central bank that should exist in monetary policy is not so clear in supervisory policy. You, you were talking before about resolution and insolvency or liquidation. If at the end of the supervisory spectrum there is some need, eventually, even if in the EU legislation we have tried to rule out the possibility for bailout, but if there is any need of state aid government assistance, there needs obviously to be a closer understanding than the strict separation that you have in monetary policy. So the, the tasks are different, the personnel is different. When I was at the IMF, I remember Manuel Guitian, another distinguished Spaniard, who was at that time the head of the central banking department, and he used to say that the, the exercise of monetary policy was a kind to a Supreme Court, the exercise of supervision was a kind to a court of first instance, and he decided that financial stability, today we will refer to it as macro proof, was a land in between. The land of financial stability was a land between monetary policy, because it does comprise, obviously, monetary, well, it does affect the performance of the monetary policy authorities in the use of the instruments, and that was clearly seen with QE and supervision, so this whole land in between. So I always thought that so that was an imprecise term, it still captures the fluidity of the concept of financial stability, and I cannot only but wholeheartedly agree with you that this fluidity is very different from the way that we have following the, the generalized advent of formal or informal interest rate targeting, we measure the, the, the monetary policy objective, the price stability objective. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for this uh, insightful uh, uh, discussion. And I have a question for Vice President uh, Constantio. Uh, since you have been at the, at, the, <laughs> at the heart of all the decisions taken at the beginning for the, for the launch of the uh, banking supervision, uh, how do you see now, after 10 years of experience, uh, the ECB banking supervision, first? What are the main challenges, uh, in your view? And secondly, uh, at, at, the, at, um, at that point, as when there was a discussion on the start of the SSM. I remember there was a lot of discussion also on the, on the separation principle between uh, monetary policy and, and banking supervision. Do you still consider that it is a, um, a key um, element uh, to be uh, taken into consideration, or is that loss a little bit is, uh, is important? Uh, as you said, insightful uh, interventions. Your question is, uh, your two questions are quite broad and uh, that refer to the specific experience of the uh, European uh, uh, project. Yes, um, so uh, my assessment is, of course, regarding banking supervision, it's a big success, uh, and that's quite consensual nowadays. Uh, in this conference, there were papers that illustrated or even convincingly demonstrated the uh, increased uh, efficiency of supervision because of the transfer to the European level. Uh, and there are many other papers already that also uh, show that. So it was, in that respect, a success. And uh, we have only to point out to the fact that the uh, SSM 
managed very well the implementation of uh, uh, the uh, uh, banking uh, uh, banking regulation, uh, in particularly the uh, Basel III and so on. And that's very important because it's one of the uh, the main functions of supervision. It also, uh, uh, everyone appreciates the way the SSM dealt with the uh, uh, gradual but firm reduction of NPLs. That was uh, also a good moment for the uh, existence uh, and activity of the SSM. And then came, of course, uh, and for me it's even more important for reasons that I will mention in a minute, the way the SSM managed the pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, fortunately, uh, we had uh, Andrea Enria uh, as head of the SSM at that point because he understood completely that uh, um, even micro -super supervisors have to take into account the macro prudential aspects of supervision. Uh, because the bias that I have found many times uh, throughout my life as a governor uh, of the Central Bank of Portugal that always had uh, banking supervision between the micro supervisors and the macro perspective is that the micro supervisor for understandable reasons in a way because we are all humans have their incentive to always ask for more capital. There is a crisis coming. Banks can fail, well, let's stop up capital. And that was not the reaction with the pandemic, uh, on, on the contrary. So I admire uh, the SSM uh, very much the way it dealt with, with the pandemic uh, shock. Uh, and finally, of course, as a result of all this, but uh, there is, of course, much merit also uh, that the regulation changed and we had Basel III and the SSM was efficient in uh, ensuring its implementation uh, in the euro area that uh, when there was the turmoil uh, in banking in the US uh, last year and Credit Suisse uh, in Europe, there were no ripples in the uh, euro area banking sector. And that was also a good uh, moment to appreciate the, uh, uh, the work the SSM has done. So I think this is consensual. And uh, we hear, and uh, Rosa even uh, quoted it, I think, that uh, normally uh, supervisors get no praise when things go well and then are uh, harshly blamed when things go wrongly. Well, this time the SSM has been quite uh, praised uh, and appreciated, so perhaps it's a moment of exception uh, to that uh, very old rule. Um, your second question was about the separation principle. Well, that's an old thing. Um, I have a bias there. And I, uh, I uh, recall uh, something that you uh, perhaps are not at all aware, uh, any of you, that in 2001, in June of 2001, the governing council of the ECB discussed, approved, and posted in the website of the ECB, and is still there, I confirmed it uh, two days ago, a note about banking supervision and why, uh, the note is entitled Central Banks, uh, no, the, uh, the role of central banks in prudential supervision. That's the title. Very strange in 2001 why that came. Of course it was, uh, our good friend uh, Tommaso Quadro Schioppe that had financial stability at the time uh, in the board of, of the ECB that uh, uh, took that initiative. And there, the arguments in favor and against giving banking supervision to central banks uh, are developed. Um, and uh, of course, the, the big um, advantages of having the central bank doing the banking supervision is that because it has much better information about financial markets, money markets, shocks, the pressures of the macroeconomy and so on, that's a big advantage. The second is that by definition, the central bank takes care of systemic risk in a way that normally it's not 
uh, in the uh, radar of micro supervisors, and third, because the central bank uh, uh, has independence and a lot of resources. Um, of course, the two main the two main uh, uh, arguments against that, which are in the note, uh, uh, are a possible conflict of interest with monetary policy and providing liquidity to uh, to banks, uh, and also perhaps. Um, the requirements of being, say, harsh to the banks in the moment uh, of a uh, uh, recessionary phase uh, that uh, monetary policy is trying to uh, counter in its uh, uh, mandate would not be compatible or the opposite in a different uh, situation. And that's the main uh, argument why uh, Germany uh, was uh, against basically the idea of having uh, supervision in, uh, in uh, the central bank. And again, we owe to Tommaso Padua Schiotta uh, another big debt because he was the man behind what is written in the treaty in Article 127, number six, which uh, uh, foresaw, put there, that by unanimous decision, the council could uh, uh, confer, I am reading, specific tasks upon the European Central Bank concerning policies relating to the prudential supervision of credit institutions and other financial institutions with the exception of insurance. Insurance always gets an exception in the treaties. Um, I don't know exactly why, but that's, uh, that's the case. So this article was there. It was approved by all countries. Many countries approved it because they thought, well, it will never happen. Unanimous rule, we won't allow it, so it will never happen. Okay, it happened. Uh, I, will, uh, um, I will reserve the explanation how it happened for your questions. <laughs> but we owe this also to uh, uh, Tommaso, that it, is, it, was, uh, it was there. So uh, that was then one argument against the possible conflict of interest with monetary policy and the... Uh, the uh, consequence of the uh, monetarist view uh, of the world, whereby providing liquidity uh, is always something that could endanger uh, monetary policy and inflation. And that's why, for instance, uh, you know, you don't find in German legislation before monetary union the function of lender of last resort. That was not spoken about because the Bundesbank did not assume that, uh, say, responsibility that was common in the legislation of many other central banks. So the separation principle, the second argument was moral hazard uh, against giving supervision. Well, let's say that the uh, conflict of interests most of the time does not emerge, uh, really. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's exaggerated, uh, that concept, because of the monetaristic view of, uh, uh, of the world that uh, Central European countries uh, always had. Um, so the conclusion of the note approved by the Governing Council was that, uh, you know, the arguments in favor were uh, uh, better and stronger than the arguments against. So the note was already reflecting a view against in the separation principle, uh, although re recognizing. But when banking super European banking supervision came, of course, the, uh, the choice, the perspective of the Central European countries was very strongly uh, about the need to have some sort of separation, which uh, is uh, what we have. I don't think uh, really it was necessary or justified, but has a whole history uh, behind it, and more than history, also uh, uh, economic doctrines about the, uh, the objectives uh, that monetary policy and banking supervision must serve. Thanks a lot. We will then come back to that. We have another question. Thank you so much for really great discussion. I have a question for Peter because I wonder 
we talk a lot about bank supervision, whereas at the moment, when we think about financial stability, a lot coming from the non-bank sector. I understand that we have a lot of supervision that bank supervision can do, but um, what should we think about the non-bank supervision and the fact that when there's a build up risk in the banking sector, there's a lot of risk could be transferred to the shadow market that the bank supervisors could not have much mandate to deal with. Do you know the, the Federal Reserve System was created uh, in reaction to a shadow banking crisis in 1907, which was uh, through the trusts, which were depository institutions that didn't even have uh, state charters uh, to engage in banking services. And this has been with the system throughout uh, uh, at least 160 years. And in an important sense, the dual banking system is a reflection that four state banks, national banks, are shadow banks. And four national banks, state banks, are shadow banks because they don't, aren't subject to the same supervisory purview. So we've, we have a lot, an, actually an awful lot of experience here. But I don't want to be coy with that question uh, because you're talking about something quite different, which is, what do we do when we have very large companies with extremely large balance sheets that are engaged in some form of intermediation, call it private credit, call it mortgage credit, call it uh, what have you. What's fascinating about the bank supervisory ecosystem is that it has evolved sometimes by legislative push, sometimes by regulatory grab uh, into all kinds of different spaces. So we may have what happened in the 1990s and 1980s which was uh, supervisory actors that were looking in on all kinds of shadow bank risks. So in the, uh, we were just talking at lunch about the, uh, the crises that began in Latin America and Mexico um, that were sovereign debt crises that um, started to unravel as the central bank raised interest rates, which affected all kinds of credit institutions, uh, that then uh, started to hit American uh, savings and loans institutions and then the banks that had funded them. That was a shadow banking and banking crisis. This is all to say, and, and accelerating through from the uh, Asian financial crises, uh, crisis, uh, the Russian crisis, long-term capital management's failure, and of course 2008 um, are all instances where the supervisory apparatus, though not subject to examination reports, did have an awful lot of information, more information than anybody else, about the kinds of instability that we had. Now, some of the institutions that were created thereafter, the, Federal, uh, the Financial Stability Oversight Council uh, in the United States, the FSB uh, as a Basel institution, are meant to plug holes in that apparatus. Uh, they have been unevenly plugged, there's no doubt about it. But if I wanted to know right now the very most about private credit on uh, that is borne by private equity institutions that are not publicly traded, publicly listed, um, funded by their insurance companies, I would probably turn to the Federal Reserve right now. And so I, I am a, I'm bullish on the supervisory ecosystem's ability to understand uh, pockets of instability even beyond their legislative mandate, in part because we have seen that from the very beginning. Some of the uh, best correspondence that we found in the 1870s were bankers insisting that the OCC had absolutely no legal authority to do ongoing examinations because the statute was basically silent on, on frequency. So I think that that kind of creativity fits within that institutionalized discretion uh, and that is not pegged to the charter itself. And let me now turn to Alexi because I, I want with him to draw in the conversation an aspect that for me is very important of banking supervision. We have been the first to have international standards that have been made. Uh, and that was with the creation of the Basel Committee, which said Basel Committee of Banking Supervision and has been essentially known for regulatory standards, not for, not for supervisory standards, uh, even if there are other courts in that, but they came much later. <laughs> so, uh, because you, you uh, look a, a lot of, of the creation of that, why do, and this, we are thinking about again, Europe, UK, <laughs> and uh, uh, the US did push for having the supervisors creating <laughs> minimum standards regulation, uh, which were, by the way, soft law, as Valero has said, so it was not law, but in fact, they become <laughs> the real standards of, 
uh, of regulation, which again, I think it's a very specific situation for other city, for other places where regulator and supervisor are. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me also to this very interesting conference. I think, um, well, there are several ways uh, to answer that question. That question. Uh, one, as a starting point, I think it's important to keep in mind uh, that the Basel Committee is very well known for Basel I agreement, Basel II, and Basel III. But even just before that, uh, in the, at least in the five years of its existence, during like 1975 and 1980, it worked on also on many other things, which could be considered closer to supervisory uh, practices and exchange many ideas on how best to supervise banks and and also as we discussed earlier uh, on over lunch was they also exchange telephone numbers because at that time they didn't know each other at all so but coming back to the question of of how they ended up uh, producing regulation well first they didn't really uh, um, at least they didn't spend time uh, opposing the two. Uh, they um, addressed um, supervisory and regulatory issues a, a bit in a, in a mixture. And then um, when uh, I mean, focusing on, on the main piece uh, which they produced, and like the Basel I agreement in, in, in the 1980s, that was maybe like from 1982 to 1986, they were focused on, on this exercise. Um, I think they did it for a mixture uh, of um, international reasons and domestic reasons, and also uh, for uh, as a request from the central bank governors, which were the, the, the authority, uh, we actually asked them to, to work on a, on a capital adequacy ratio. So there was first a, a few years uh, where during which they, they discussed uh, um, um, in particular, this question of, of capital, uh, the, cap the decrease of capital of capitalization in in, uh, in countries. So they they exchanged, but it was only not uh, with a regulatory uh, uh, objective in mind. It, they just they just exchanged on um, on um, what they perceived as a declining uh, as declining uh, capital adequacy ratio in various countries. And uh, although they were focused on other things in in the 1970s. Uh, like uh, how to deal with country risk also, uh, that's something that's been quite forgotten, but at the time they were really worried about what, was, what would later happen in 82 in, in Latin America. Um, they accumulated the data, and, um, and then I think two things uh, arrived. Uh, one was the, the question of the competition, uh, competition issues and the, 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 the fact that the U.S. felt really, uh, in, particular, in particular the U.S., not only, but also in particular the, the Americans, uh, uh, like as a competitive disadvantage with Japanese banks, there was, there was a, the Japanese uh, um, uh, banks who were really making progress, and that was really worrying the American authorities. So there was a big uh, leveling playing field issue, uh, and, and and because of that, uh, also because of the debt crisis of the 1982 debt crisis, there was there were heated debates in the U.S. and the Congress pressed uh, the American authorities. Uh, to do something about supervision, and then the American authorities turned to the Basel Committee to, to, to do something about that. So that, there was a kind of political uh, story in, in, in there. And then also there was this more prudential, if I may say, uh, story in, in there also, because it also um, already internally they had been discussing um, uh, capital adequacy ratio and capitalization in, in general, and um, they had well, first seen that uh, the capitalization of banks had been declining over the years, uh, and because there had been also this 1982 first uh, crisis, not, I mean, related to a kind of a different story, but it, they were a bit more anxious about uh, risks and, and the rise of risk. So um, so th there was this, um, also the, the, the idea that uh, because supervision was supposed to be as, uh, the supervisory apparatus was supposed to be as solid as individual banks was, uh, capitalization would be uh, an important uh, thing to focus on, and then the two the two dynamics are kind of internal to uh, banking supervision and external, if I may say, coming from more from a political pressure, uh, converged and 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 uh, and, um, and with many steps uh, pushed also the committee to to uh, 
to to do some kind of regulatory practices, even though they didn't really oppose uh, both uh, both activities, regulation and supervision. They, it's, it's difficult to draw a clear line how they, at least in the archives, how they would uh, that is supervision, that is regulation. Uh, they they so what they what they did in in, in the end was not like. Uh, they did not uh, enact the law. It was soft law, as Maria said. It's like they, they could make only regulation. So, um, so there was there was these two these two these two strong dimensions, and uh, and then there was the, the then also nationally uh, supervisors uh, or nas national authorities supported any effort to reinforce supervision nationally, and they found that the Basel Committee could be an, an addition to this process to the pressure to to. Uh, uh, what they felt also was some kind of um, losing um, uh, losing power towards banks because they felt that banks were internationalizing more and more, and they wanted to uh, to keep pace a bit behind uh, behind behind this. So, um, if you look at, for instance, French 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 archives and French authorities really said, okay, we we welcome anything coming from Basel to reinforce our own uh, our own supervisory uh, apparatus. So it's a mixture of, of different things which uh, ended up in, in in this supervisory body and in ending ending uh, ending up doing kind of regulatory things. But initially, at, at the first meetings for many years, actually they said we are we don't want to announce any regulation. We are here only to exchange on best practices, and, and that's what we are supposed to do: to get to know each other and to and to exchange information. Uh, on best practices, it was it, it really came progressively. It was like the like the panda stock was <laughs> the, the, it, it grew out yeah. of evolution mm. into an that yeah yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. But uh, in fact, when there was the crisis, there was a use of this clause to create the ESRB, which, by the way, covers insurance. <laughs> but the secretariat of the ESRB was given to the ECB by using this clause <laughs> at that point of time. And at the same time, they still have in the De La Rosière uh, report the idea that it is still impossible <laughs> to go further and to do uh, a relationship that will be direct supervision, uh, that will be a task of really controlling <laughs> day to the day-to-day -day life of a bank. So what uh, we really call uh, micro-supervision. And it's true that the, the treaty is very general, so <laughs> it doesn't uh, differentiate uh, uh, between the two. Uh, so we've heard what uh, uh, Pedro said, that, for, that it was the shift to avoid uh, avoid the use of public money in the eurozone that was really the thing and and by the way i'm wondering i will ask uh, rather uh, after uh, in the question of uh, rafael i think that the implicit goal that is assigned to supervision not in the laws is avoid failure <laughs> avoid the failures of the banks so that's why when there is a failure everybody says where's the supervisor what, <laughs> what did they do and I would say that even if we got praise, why? Because there were failures, but not in the Eurozone. <laughs> this is why <laughs> we were praised last year. <laughs> but the, we, for the public in general, this is not a legal <laughs> uh, statement, but this is <laughs> seen, and this is why I think it's an impossible task, because we can avoid failures, so that's <laughs> uh, in general. But first yeah. you. Well, let me then go into uh, more details about the uh, origins and creation of uh, European uh, uh, supervision. Um, it's not just uh, about uh, uh, the narratives that Pedro mentioned, uh, because uh, these two periods uh, dealt with, with the totally different objectives. The first period, uh, which is uh, what he called the uh, internal market uh, uh, narrative, was about negative integration. 
eliminating obstacles uh, and allowing then, then the financial service could be offered cross-border, the liberty of the establishment, and then in the second banking directive in 89, the, uh, the financial passport uh, that anyone, any institution from uh, a member country could uh, go and offer cross-border uh, and so on. It was negative integration. And that had not, at the end of it, any concept of a supranational positive integration, uh, which came because there was monetary union, uh, as he uh, mentioned also. And we have to understand that. Because the emergency of a supranational function uh, of uh, European banking supervision came, uh, as Edward said, at, uh, as a surprise in the, old, uh, in the whole uh, evolution of things. No one before had thought about that or that was uh, possible, and uh, everything that had been discussed before did not include uh, that step. Uh, but it was not just an emergence or a result of a uh, moment of a big crisis that involved potentially public money. Uh, it was not that. It had a background. It had a background uh, that uh, is linked, uh, was linked uh, to the minimalist design of monetary union. Monetary union uh, uh, did not use at all the uh, uh, optimal currency area theory that existed at the time, not at all, uh, because even in the uh, uh, OCA, the view about financial integration was a positive one. In the approaches of Peter Cannon or Ingram, the uh, uh, a monetary union was positive also because all countries would have uh, easy access to uh, 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 financing in the integrated monetary union, and that would mitigate uh, imbalances, at least in the first period before adjustment requirements. But in our experience of the European Monetary Union, financial integration had huge negative impacts. And uh, the minimal design of monetary union was, well, it's, there is a single currency and there is a fiscal break. And that's enough. It will work. It will smooth. Each country has now to deal with the necessary adjustment under these conditions that these will spread low inflation everywhere, and that in itself is a guarantee that the rest of the economy works efficiently. Uh, and so there were three main shortcomings in this design. One was that there was no macroeconomic stabilization function uh, in the center, uh, as if it was not necessary. And uh, as we saw afterwards, it was necessary. It's not yet a permanent one, but it was necessary when crisis uh, emerged. The second uh, shortcoming was also that there was no crisis management procedures to deal with temporary liquidity squeezes among member countries. There was nothing foreseen. Uh, and uh, at a certain point in time, as we all know, the central bank had to uh, act and intervene. Uh, and the third shortcoming was that there was no European, uh, uh, European uh, uh, banking supervision. Why was this a shortcoming? Well, because uh, of the uh, consequence of monetary union was a huge and immediate and dramatic financial integration of all uh, members of the monetary union. One has to uh, keep in mind that from 1999, the beginning of monetary union, until 2007, the credit flows from banks in the core of the uh, uh, monetary union, the central uh, European countries, the credit flows from the banks in the center to the periphery countries, the five countries in the, in the periphery, increased by 400% from 1999 to 2007, quintupled uh, uh, in such a period. And as a result, there was a huge credit boom in the periphery because credit, uh, and then there was a slump afterwards, of course, but there was a huge credit boom. 
the transfers from uh, the, the banks uh, in the center uh, European countries to the banks in the periphery amounted uh, at the end of 2007 to 50% of the GDP of those peripheral countries. That was absolutely staggering. It was a tsunami. And I was governor of Central Bank of Portugal. We had supervision, but we could not oppose because that would be against liberty of uh, capital movements. Mm -hmm. We could not do anything about this. What, who should have done something about this was an European supervisor that would draw attention to the banks in the core that uh, they were not managing correctly the credit risk. Uh, they were not considering uh, the credit risk that they were incurring by having those uh, huge credit flows to the banks in the periphery. The same in the capital markets, by the way. During that period, the 10-year uh, bonds yields of all countries converged. If you look to a picture uh, over the whole period until now, there is a period where the yields of 10-year bonds of all member countries were practically equal. So also the capital markets had a failure of managing credit risk properly. And that happened also in banking. And that, of course, when the crisis of banking came from the US with the subprime and all the things we know, the uh, not only several European countries were overheated and had created, of course, huge imbalances, but also the banking sectors were, the, the banks were also overstretched. And when that uh, crisis came, then the banks were in trouble. There were then public guarantees and all the story that uh, uh, you know. Um, so, and this occurred because of the bad design of the monetary union and these consequences with the numbers that I just quoted. Now, going into more detail, the, the petite histoire. Um, well, there was then a banking crisis in Europe, so lack of capital. Uh, American economists were calculating the capital requirements of the banking sector by using numbers from the uh, from the uh, uh, stock exchange capitalization uh, that uh, and then there was a famous uh, quantification uh, in mid-2011 by uh, Asharia, Engel, and others that said the European banks need one trillion euros. Well, it never happened, and it was not necessary, clearly, but that was there. And then in August 2011, the IMF made a public recommendation saying that Europe, the Euro area, had to create a program of directly European banking capitalization. Banking capitalization done by an European uh, institution. That was the IMF. Then after uh, the later part of uh, 2011, the focus of the banking crisis uh, was, became the Spanish uh, banks in particular the banking, the uh, Spanish Cajas. Uh, um, and there was a big focus on that. And there was then the disposition that there a, a program uh, of financial assistance was necessary to Spain, which could or not include uh, a direct uh, recapitalization. Um, a word about that in a moment. Then, during that period, in late 2011, of course, there was a public letter from seven minister, finance ministers of uh, Central European countries stating that if, of course, there will be financial assistance to Spanish banks, then we have to have some uh, rights of supervision over uh, those banks that get that, uh, that financial assistance, because it was precisely with the objective of mi minimizing what would be then the commitments that the loans from the center uh, would, uh, would incur, the risks that would incur, it was to minimize that. So supervision 
of countries that uh, would have such a programs uh, as to involve supervision. Then there was the idea, of course, that Spain would not be the only case where this thing would have to happen because banking sectors were also in bad situations in Ireland, in Portugal, and so on, uh, in Greece, and so on. So there was the idea that indeed this would be necessarily a, a larger problem. It was not just Spain. And so at the beginning of 2012, the idea began to crystallize with the push of the Commission also that uh, pushed for that, but also, uh, you know, with this vision that the, the more countries would require this, began to crystallize the idea that then we need bank, European banking supervision. And that's what, in the end, we need. It's not just for Spain or for other countries that would have uh, 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 restructuring loans uh, for the banking sectors. Uh, and then that's when we came in June to the idea of European Bank uh, uh, supervision in the summit. Uh, not a word about banking union, not a word. Neither in the uh, document that came out of the summit in, 2000, in June 2012, neither in the roadmap approved by the Council in December of 2012. There is no mentioning of uh, banking union at all in those documents. It was banking supervision. A few months before it was realized that it was unavoidable then to have European resolution. Uh, and that's when then we worked to uh, have also the, uh, uh, the SRB or the, uh, the uh, SRM um, began also. Um, so that's how uh, really it happened in detail. One of the uh, objectives that they had in mind was that the uh, European banking supervision would also give a big contribution to uh, solve the so-called doom loop, the fact that uh, banks in the, in the, uh, in the periphery, uh, in weak economies, had a huge portfolio of domestic uh, 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 sovereign bonds. And, and that, of course, if a country, as Greece illustrated, if a country as such enter into a situation of unsustainable sovereign debt, that will impact the banks in a big way. So there was the idea that European supervision in some ways would deal with that. But it was not, although it was stated as the main objective, the main objective was not uh, really that, but the idea that if there will be several assistance programs to banking sectors in different countries, we need banking supervision. We need to be there. We need to see how the money is used, how the banks are really uh, restructured and improved and all that. And that's uh, how, how it came. So it came in a way in accordance, we would say, with the view of uh, integration of the uh, functionalist uh, view about integration, there was mon monetary union, the spillover of that was creating a problem in supervision, and that's why supervision occurred. But it was more complex that, than that because it was also mo mostly about the so-called intergovernmental uh, doctrine about integration. It happened because it was the way in a situation of crisis of uh, uh, managing their interests uh, and having then the recourse to uh, banking supervision. Well, the, uh, the SSM was then the result of that. And as uh, Nicolas Veron uh, uh, writes in uh, his uh, latest uh, paper, the, uh, the SSM regulation was, uh, he quotes some papers, it was, as he said, a, a sort of joint uh, work of the Commission and the ECB. And it's true, because, of course, the only way to have European banking supervision, making it legal, was to use this Article 127, Number 6. There was no other basis for that. And that's then, uh, you know, Germany and other countries had to accept the idea with great reluctance and demanding 
here, all the firewalls possible within the ECV and the separation principle and all, uh, all of that. So that uh, was uh, the only way. And indeed, uh, during the, um, after the summit, uh, uh, we had uh, intense work here at the ECB, uh, and I was representing the ECB in this interaction with the Commission, and my absolutely excellent point man was Pedro, because then Pedro was my counselor here at the ECB. So uh, he, was, he was going to uh, Brussels all the time for the technicalities and so on. So it was indeed how, uh, how it happened uh, and the way this then was, uh, was uh, developed. It was uh, um, as a consequence of all these, uh, these aspects. So that's the detailed origin uh, of the thing. It was not then related at all to the previous efforts of negative integration, of uh, you know, abolishing all uh, obstacles to a free, uh, uh, full uh, circulation of uh, financial products and uh, making services across uh, the space, it was not negative integration. It was totally different because monetary union had changed everything, uh, and monetary union was not well designed from the beginning, and then for we had these crises that in the end forced the uh, uh, Central European countries to reluctantly accept uh, the European banking supervision without banking union and certainly without uh, European deposit guarantee schemes that to this day are not there. The roadmap approved in December 2012 about uh, uh, um, depositors uh, uh, protection was about what was published uh, the following two years after, which was a, a directive harmonizing, harmonizing the 100,000 uh, euros uh, and harmonizing other aspects of the functioning of national uh, deposit guarantee schemes. Uh, and to this day, it was not possible to advance that. Uh, Nicola also quotes in it that same paper, uh, and I finished uh, this answer with that because it's, well, interesting, I think. Um, the President Van Rampoy wrote in 2014 uh, in one of his pieces that uh, he, he recalls what uh, we all knew at the time, that in 2012-13 we were very careful to avoid any reference to banking union because that in certain places would lead people to the barricade. That's what the hero. It was forbidden to talk officially about banking union because, of course, Germany and other countries didn't want at all the uh, European deposit guarantee scheme. So uh, uh, and that's the sort of uh, very incomplete banking union that we have now. We'll come back to that, but just, just to, yeah. <laughs> to underline that because there is a narrative which I think is terrible. <laughs> From the beginning, we say three pillars, but it was not true. <laughs> Nobody was okay with... Uh, with three uh, pillars uh, was the commission and some uh, countries, some uh, governments. Uh, yes, but, uh, but it was it not... was an attempt to push, push. And, and the commission from early on was talking about the three pillars. Yes, but it was the commission, so uh, uh, not the council. Yeah. And mm -hmm. which is extremely markedly the opposite of what we've heard from Peter, uh, that in fact the... the full formalization of banking supervision in the U.S. came with the FDIC yeah. in 1933. <laughs> well, so here we have really a, a very different uh, situation, even opposed mm -hmm. on that. I see that Nicola want to, <laughs> wants to say something. Vitor, Nicolas Veron, uh, Bruegel and Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, sorry for joining late. I uh, was listening to Claudia Buch uh, on the other side of town. Um, <laughs> so Vitor was very generous, uh, and I cannot resist uh, uh, specifying that the paper he's mentioning will be released uh, by Bruegel and the Peterson Institute on June 25, so in two weeks' time. It's actually going to be published by Bruegel as a book. And it goes uh, back to all the uh, history and also the current policy debates on banking union. So end of the...
publicity uh, advertising parties. Uh, actually, um, you gave me too much credit because the description of the SSM regulation as joint drafting between the ECB uh, and uh, the European Commission is something I quoted from the excellent paper of Bodie Nielsen and Sandrino uh, Smith, the role of the EU institutions in establishing the banking union collaborative leadership in the EMU reform process, which was published in 2018. And I really recommend reading that paper. It took me time to discover it. It's, I think, one of the best papers on the decision-making process uh, that I took a lot of inspiration from uh, also in, uh, in writing this book. Um, so this, of course, the pretext of saying this is that I have to ask a question. So let me ask a question to Vitor. <laughs> uh, is, uh, you mentioned uh, that the European Commission has been talking about banking union actually since, I think, May 2012. Um, the Council only did it, I think, late in 2013 or even 2014, so very late in the decision-making sequence. Uh, when, when did the ECB, do you remember that? When did the ECB start using the banking union, uh, the expression banking union? Because it was somewhere in the middle. For example, on deposit insurance, the ECB did and you, uh, but not only you, uh, did consistently advocate banking uh, deposit insurance even when it was taboo in council. But do you remember when the ECB used the expression banking union first? In 2011, I made a speech where I said we have, must have an European FDIC which involved, of course, the uh, supervision and the deposit uh, guarantee scheme. But the expression banking union, I don't uh, recall when the ECB really started to, to use it. Uh, no, uh, I don't know. A commission, as you said, uh, in May 2012. And of course, by then, the ECB also, we all were talking, of course, about the banking union and the three pillars and so on by then. Uh, that, that that's the history, but it was forbidden to talk about it in the council or uh, in such uh, such uh, level of decision makers. Okay, so now let me open in, uh, the floor for the questions to Vitor Alexis and, and all those. Uh, he, he, Maybe waiting for a question, uh, Rosa, on, on this question of the objectives <coughs> of supervision, what we are measuring. Because I really think that the implicit objective is no failure, no micro failure or micro supervision. <coughs> it is often said that though that might be sometimes implicit, um, a regime of zero failure will be terribly inefficient. So we need to be able to manage crisis. And I think, you know, that. Banking union, in a way, what Peter was also describing is how in this system of institutionalized discretion, how can we manage that transition to manage crisis in a way that minimizes losses and also in a way that makes who is going to carry those losses acceptable. And, and I have a couple of reflections because there is not a perfect answer. And really, I, I, I remember when I was writing my book, um, talking about the concept of burden sharing, it reminded me that uh, when my children were small, and one of them is starting to learn about sharing. Uh, he was always thinking that sharing belonged to his younger sister. So, so she, you have to share, but it was completely a unilateral concept. It was no reciprocity, there was no bilateral. And I always thought this simplistic behavior of children is often replicated in the international arena. I mean, Peter's um, book, you know, is, is, when you compare it with the European history, I mean, what, when I studied banking regulation in the U.S., I thought, and this was a long time ago, 1990, I thought, well, I hope we never get to such a system in Europe. But we have. We have, because we have created this multi-layer structure in which, first, with the European authorities, we created a federalization of the system of regulation, even though there was no centralization because of the Meroni doctrine. And then we created a partial transfer of competences in which we have centralized supervision, centralized resolution with more limited tools because of the, 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 the resolution fund and also the relationship with ESM, so very complex system. And then we don't have EDIs. And I have had a discussion with Peter Costanzo about 
Lender of Last Resort, one of the things in which I have a very, and I know my friend René Smith has also a very strong. So I think, you know, but you're right, you know, eh, that's why by the, when, when you were going through the arguments of setting banking union, you described them very well, the vicious link, the conditionality, the independent supervision, kind of redesign part of the failures, the, 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 the failure of conception of monetary union that we had as the abandonment of the coincidence of monetary policy and supervision, as again Padua Stiopa in a very famous speech said. So what we have ended is that we have ended with, yeah, we, we want to prevent failure. At the same time, we want to manage failure. And in the US, in 1913, the federal research system was created with a function of supervision and discount window, lender of last resort. And it took 30 years for creating a system of managing crisis, which was the special bank insolvency regime of 1933, together with the creation of deposit insurance. So it may take another 30 years for us to get. But I, I do think, um, and that's why, you know, whenever Eduard asks a question, Eduard is extremely witty, knowledgeable, and, 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 and um, has a sense of how supervision works. He knows insurance, he knows banking, he knows the micro, he knows the macro. So there is something in what you're saying that is true. This forbearance, I remember like Germany summer of 2012, Spanish cajas de ahorros, Germany said if we could place supervision in the room, that would be better, you know, the farther away from the interest of national authorities to avoid forbearance. So there is something there of avoiding failure, also because when you have failure, it becomes so costly. I mean, Lehman Brothers, they have been reflecting in the U.S. about what happened and not happened. So there is, there is something very, as always, very smart about your question that makes me, makes me think further that, yes, we want to have a system of managed crisis management. Because otherwise, what we do not have is what happened during the global financial crisis, which is bailout programs, indiscriminate bailout programs, and therefore affecting taxpayers. We, not, we need to avoid all of that. So we want to make institutions failure to save. And in a way, what um, Rafael was saying in his model is, how do we make supervision as a system that takes us away from failure? You, you had in, 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 your, in, in your graph, you know, it's the closer, you know, that, that we have to avoid in failure. But still, failure looms in the horizon. Failure looms in the horizon. And I think, you know, that this avoidance of failure is something for which supervisors, national and European, will try their utmost best to avoid. If I may say another point on, on what Alexi was saying, I remember um, Peter Cook, when he was talking about the Basel Committee, which obviously he used to be the, called the Cook Committee, he was saying that, he says, the committee, and that's the evolving nature of supervision at the international level, is, has three C's. The first is contact, the second is cooperation, and the third is coordination. You go from contact, from the exchange of phone numbers, to cooperation and coordination. I mean, what we have done with Banking Union, we have gone farther than coordination and harmonization and federalization, because we have gone to centralization. And in, in that, you know, you know, happy birthday to you and to the SSM, because mm -hmm. I think it's an amazing accomplishment. I was personally talking about failure, very concerned in March 2023, that the Silicon Valley and the Credit Suisse will have ripples in the Eurozone. But either it didn't and we didn't learn, which is part of this thing that you never hear about supervisory successes. Or if it did, you know, it was managed very well or it didn't happen just because of the, the power of, of deterrence. And, and then the last thing I would say, which I didn't say when you were going through the arguments for and against, one of the arguments that was also mentioned in the UK for uh, dismantling the FSA is that the ethos, the culture, and the priorities of the FSA became very much aligned with very, uh, from the perspective of systemic stability, very nitty gritty issues, you know, conduct issues and consumer protection. And they kind of lost, uh, lost sight of, of the picture that, you know, that the house was starting to burn. So, so that was another argument for bringing supervision back to, to, the, to the Bank of England. And it ties with what you're saying and what Tomaso Pado Schiopa is that the central bank is, you know, by having the power to supervise, can know what to do in, in a crisis. Because if, if you know what happens 
on a sunny day. You can also know what happens on a rainy day. And, and Peter was saying that he will have, you know, if he was going to look into private equity or really anything, he would still trust the information of the Fed. So these points kind of, um, a bit to, to go back to there is something very deep about your question, about this implicit goal of avoiding failures, which is in itself an impossible task. And if we don't avoid failures, to manage the failures. And maybe to Uh, because we need not to be complacent about the banking union, especially as supervisors, uh, and you, s uh, you still wanted to say about management of crisis in the union. You raised the issue of the uh, ESRB and its creation, and I uh, really didn't talk about it, not about another point which is important, which is macroprudential supervision. Um, Macroprudential supervision emerged uh, as an important uh, uh, subject after the, uh, the crisis, of, of course, as we all know, uh, with specific instruments which have to do also with regulation, uh, the way the regulation takes care of certain aspects in relation to the uh, systemic risk, not the micro individual bank risk, but about the systemic risk, and uh, uh, there we lost. I mean, uh, in our negotiation about the SSM uh, uh, regulation, there is Article 4 about macroprudential function, but we lost because what is there is not enough uh, at all. Not only the instruments that are given to uh, macroprudential, which are enumerated uh, then uh, in the uh, CR, uh, CRRD, uh, the instruments are very few, but also the ECB is responsible for supervision, the ECB and then the separation and so on, which is uh, all there in the SSM regulation. Uh, and then the ECB can only uh, top up measures of macroprudential nature that uh, the countries uh, would have taken or not taken. Um, which is limited, and there is a discussion which never really occurred, and our two views about uh, jurists uh, regarding the, the point that if a country has nothing in the macroprudential uh, instruments, has zero, can the ECB decide because it's stopping up from zero or not? Only if the country has some degree of uh, measure, and then the ECB can top up. Um, uh, so. This was never experienced, uh, but the powers of macroprudential are very weak. Uh, in the, uh, the whole framework of supervision, we tried uh, many times in all the reviews of uh, the European legislation to conquer something. We never managed to conquer anything uh, more than was already. Uh, in the SSM uh, uh, regulation, uh, which is uh, really a pity. And also, we lost, we ECB, uh, I'm still talking in those terms, um, uh, we lost also in what regards the SRB. Uh, the SRB was a useful concept because it involved only the uh, European, uh, uh, the, the members of the European Union that uh, were not in the Monetary Union, so it was a useful uh, forum in that respect. Uh, could you can issue recommendations, uh, no more than that. Uh, and the idea of the Commission, uh, what it was in the initial proposal of the Commission, is that the ESRB would be inside the ECB, uh, and that did not happen. The uh, ECB was given uh, uh, autonomy, although the, uh, e the, the, the ESRB was given autonomy, uh, although the Secretariat uh, was insured uh, by, the, uh, by the ECB. Uh, and the, uh, the, the main uh, body of the ESRB is presided by the president of the ECB. But it's just that. So it's not a thing of the ECB, and it should have been, uh, and we lost uh, also that uh, battle. 
uh, which weakened, of course, the, uh, the uh, ESRB. No one in general has cared about the recommendations of the uh, SRB that were uh, given, uh, you know, several times. If, it will, if they would have been recommendations from the ECB, I guarantee you that they would have uh, uh, a stronger power behind it, uh, but uh, that, that's not the case. So, and that would help, in a way, would help also the macroprudential function that is weak in the official legislation and also the contribution that the SRB could give to that uh, perspective uh, of uh, financial stability was uh, diminished as a result of the, uh, the, the institution solution that was found, which was found just to not increase too much the powers of the ECB. And that was a pure political reason, nothing conceptual behind that uh, decision. Thank you very much. I, I am afraid that we have exhausted our time. But, uh, yeah. the, this discussion could last a lot because we'll uh, we have a lot of interesting things. So let me just uh, ask you to an applause for our panelists.